I'm interviewing Nate Berman. Nate, uh, I'll first ask you to give your full name, if you could. Nathan Berman. Okay. And how old are you? 82. And what's your address? Natick. Mm -hmm. Are you currently married? Yes. What's your wife's name? Arlene. Okay. And uh, how many children do you have? Two. What are their names? Mark and David. Uh -huh. Grandchildren? Grandchildren, but not grandchildren. Uh, how, well, how many do you have? Two, oh, gran just, two just... grandchildren. Oh, okay. What are their names? Mark and David. Then. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and where were you born? Boston. Okay. And where you were raised? In uh, Mattapan. Okay. What year was that when you were born? 1915. Okay. Um, when did you move to Natick? 37 years ago. Mm -hmm. Can you remember what it was like when you were, you were growing up? When I was growing up, yes. yes. Well, can you little. describe that? Well, I was growing up just at the trans, at mo a great deal of the transition from, you can't say horse and buggy because they were uh, autos, but was when electricity was first becoming widespread, Telephones were first becoming widespread. Mm -hmm. For example, I can remember the lamplighter going down the streets. We still had gas street lights when I was very young. I can remember my house being switched from, converted from gas to electric, electricity. Uh -huh. Various things, I can remember the old crystal radio sets and then the first tube sets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then obviously later came the TV but airplanes too. Mm -hmm. I can remember when they Lindbergh 1927 flew across the Atlantic and it made... Where were you then? Mattapan. Oh, were, you, uh, were you just listening to it on the radio? or? Oh yeah, what was very it? avidly. Uh, what was that like? Was everybody very exciting? It was uh, well, like in, in later years, landing a man in the moon. It seemed to be an impossible feat at the time it was done. Uh huh. That's great. Um, what's your family background? Are they I had a sis one sister. Mm -hmm. My parents were both immigrants. They'd come over from Russia separately. Mm -hmm when they were very young. I can remember them going to e evening school to become citizens, studied history, English. Mm -hmm. They were both literate when they came here, but they were literate in Russian, in Hebrew, mm -hmm. and Polish, I think, but not in English. What part of Russia did they come from? Uh, the south, uh, the I'm trying to think, southern Russia. Where I forget the name. Georgia, maybe or no? It's oh. the. You get old. You get sure, sure. lose your memory. It'll right. come to me in a few it's okay. minutes. Whenever it does. Um, now, when and where did you enter the military? I entered in 1943. Mm -hmm. at Camp Devons, Massachusetts. What branch? It was Army? Well, after basic training, I was put into the Quartermaster Corps mm -hmm. at Camp Lee, which is now Fort Lee, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was your task there, your job? Well, there I was uh, taking training when they gave us uh, they gave me a test in uh, languages, and I passed the French in French. Mm -hmm. So I was transferred out of Fort Lee to Camp Ritchie in Maryland into military intelligence. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Did, um, do you remember a lot of family members and friends joining the military along with you? Everybody. Everybody. This was the time, I think, when we had, what, 12 million people in, the, in arms? Mm -hmm. And our population at that time was only about 150 million, so 
Anybody who was warm was going into the service. Was, what was the sentiment at the time? Oh, the sentiment was 100% back of the army in support of the troops. Mm -hmm. Not like we had later. Mm -hmm. Did you did you like that uh, that particular specialty in the in the military intelligence? Uh, yeah, it was a little hairy. They were getting us the, ready to work to be parachuted in to work with the underground French underground the Maquis prior to the get to get ready for the invasion of Europe. Oh. Um. <clears throat> And where was you after the training at Fort Lee? Where was your first duty station? No, I, no, no. I, oh. I, I went from Fort Lee to Camp Ritchie, okay. military intelligence. Well, I got uh, smashed up in maneuvers in Camp Ritchie. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little confused here because mm -hmm. I got a fractured skull there. I think that when I got recovered, they sent me to a re replacement depot, and I flunked the overseas exam. I was way underweight to begin with, and on top of that, I just had the fractured skull, mm -hmm. so they sent me down to Fort Sam Houston. Where, uh, how did you hurt yourself? Night maneuvers in uh, the mountains of West Maryland, Camp Ritchie is in, was in Maryland, in fact. All around Washington at that time, there were all kinds of these little camps, military intelligence, OSS, all kinds of secret camps that nobody was supposed to know about. Mm -hmm. Which have sin since been declassified, I take it. Yeah, well, they've been, mm -hmm. I don't know how many of them are still in existence. Mm -hmm. um, so when you got to Fort Sam Houston, what did you do there? At first, that was put to work teaching English to illiterate uh, inductees. They, they had a big classification center, uh, induction center at, at Fort Sam. Mm -hmm. But after a fairly short time, I was put into assigned to classification of the inductees as they came in. Mm -hmm. Were you down there? Did you form any closer, tight friendships with anyone? Oh, yeah. In fact, I'm going to, at the end of this month, we're having a reunion with a couple who live in Ohio. Huh. I'm going to meet them down in uh, Mr. Connecticut. What, um, I mean, these people that you continually saw over the years? No, we had, in fact, uh, w when we first got discharged, we communicated with them often, but this was a lot of years ago, and this time, after about 10, 15 years, we, they lost track of us, we lost track of them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, last year, we got a funny letter, a letter addressed to Nathan Berman and saying, I don't know if you're the Nathan Berman that we knew when we were in service down at Fort Sam Houston, and it turned out that their son had looked up all Nathan Berman's living around New England. They knew we'd lived around New, in New England. Uh -huh. And he, they'd sent out the same letter to all of them, and we, they hit the jackpot with us, and we communicated with them, and it so happened. We were, going out, we were driving out to a wedding of my wife's nephew in Minnesota, mm -hmm. and that already scheduled the trip. And we were staying, we, one of our stops was in Cleveland, and it, they were living there. And when we spoke to them on the phone, they got so excited, we made arrangements to meet, and we didn't even have to rearrange our plans to meet them in Cleveland. And we did, and we had a wonderful time together. And now they have a son who lives in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So we're meeting them halfway between their son's house and our house in Mystic, Connecticut, at the end of this month. Oh, that's great. Um, so how long uh, did you spend at Fort Sam Houston? About two years. Mm -hmm. And what dates were those from, do you remember? Uh, I'd say from uh, 44 to 46 when I got discharged in February. Mm -hmm. um, did you like what you were doing down there? 
classification was very interesting. Of course, the army functioned then as all armies do from necessities. Mm -hmm. They went strictly by what their needs were. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you were at all times, we had a list of critical skills. Mm -hmm. If a man was a physicist, for example, he got pulled out immediately, and there were, depending upon the time and the uh, needs, we had various critical skills we were looking for. And outside of that, we, these skills surmount, critical skills surmounted everything. And outside of that, we got general directions from uh, the Army, from Washington, as to what they needed. Mm -hmm. And right at the time of the Battle of the Bulge, they needed riflemen, and anybody who came in almost automatically became a rifleman. And and as, unless he, as I said, he had some critical skill. Mm -hmm. Whereas by the time I went in, there was still enough openings and stuff so that where my background had been in merchandising, that they did put me into the quartermaster. What kind of merchandising did you? Well, I'd worked as an assistant buyer for Felines in Boston. Mm -hmm. So they associated that with warehousing, the distribution of clothing and things of that nature, so. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> did your duties ever change while you were down there, or did? Not once I got to be in uh, classification. I stayed in classification. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that a little more, the classification? Yeah, the Army, uh, when you go, when, went into the service, you got a series of tests. Mm -hmm. right after induction to show mechanical aptitude and various other aptitudes and skills. Mm -hmm. And based upon this, we, uh, we assigned an MOS, which is a military occupation specialty number. Mm -hmm. If I remember, and this was over 50 years ago, so I may not remember exactly, 345, for example, was a, milit was a rifleman, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And you'd also, the, you'd also be given a civilian occupational skill, which also, if I remember, the militaries went from one to 500 and civilian from 500 to 1,000. So mm -hmm. you'd have everybody assigned to the, would have two numbers. And then furthermore, you'd classify, we use the forerunner of the, computers in those days. This was just pre-computer days. Mm -hmm. They did have one, I think, the Remington Rand, which was tremendous. It took up more than the room, temperature had to be. But in those days, we had a McBeast sorting system. You, there was a card, I'd say, about six by eight mm -hmm. at a guess. And it had various, you'd notch the card according to man's military occupational skill and civilian occupational skill, if he could drive a motorcycle, <clears throat> if he was a truck driver, if he spoke any of several languages and which ones he spoke, all this was notched. <clears throat> and they'd be put into a big file. Mm -hmm. And if the Army had a need for anything, you just something like a long knitting needle in the various thing and it would pick out the alt out of a maybe thousand two thousand cards you'd have in a file if you're <coughs> looking for example for someone who went spoke French fluently the needle would pick out everybody who sp spoke French and then if you wanted to restrict it further to physical weight or height or anything of that nature, you could re pull it out so <clears throat> you could very quickly sort of man, get exactly what you were looking for by means of this, by now, by today's standards, very primitive mm -hmm. system. You, you wouldn't have to look at every card, you'd just pull them right, the needle would pull them right out for you. Hmm. But this was a mechanical needle that would go in there? No, a manual. You just you put just it push in. push it right in? Mm. Um, <clears throat> so you never uh, served overseas while you were No. In? Okay. 
Um, who would you say was your, your closest friend in the service? Oh, that has a young uh, man by the name of Sam Glass. Mm -hmm. His background and mine were remarkably close, so I was about five years older than he, but he came from Mattapan the same as I did. Mm -hmm. He went to the U of Massachusetts the same as I did. He spoke French the same as I did, and we both ended up <coughs> from quartermaster into uh, military intelligence at Camp Lee, Virginia. And as a matter of fact, his father had a jewelry store right in Blue Hill Avenue, which was the center street in Mattapan. Mm -hmm. And he'd never write home, and I was married. He was single. I was married. I was writing home constantly. <coughs> so my wife would walk down to his father's store and read the letter so his parents knew what was going on. Hmm. That's interesting you mentioned UMass. Um, what did you study at UMass? Economi uh, economics. Uh -huh. You received a bachelor degree? Yeah. Hmm. Um, uh, did you stay in contact with them over the years? It's the f first few and then we drifted apart. How'd you first meet? In boot camp? Or? Yeah, I mean, we, we met at uh, Camp Lee. Mm -hmm. We got talking. And we found out we had this much in common. He he had a he also had a very funny experience. <clears throat> he did get overseas, and mm -hmm. while he was playing baseball over there, getting he broke a leg, and that didn't heal too well, I guess. So they he couldn't be parachuted in too well. <clears throat> so they took him and put him in one of the English Channel Islands as part of the military. Occupation force, of, mm -hmm. and these, from the way he tells the story, and it's a very funny story, uh, they'd bypass some, some of the, they didn't take over all the Channel Islands because it wasn't worth the effort, the loss of manpower to take them. They let them stay occupied by the Germans, but mm -hmm. on the other hand, they blockaded them so that they couldn't do much of anything and they get replacement food fixed. And one night it seems that the British from one of the islands that had been bypassed got so desperate for food that they raided the island that Sam was stationed on. And he said, if you ever wanted to see the biggest foul up in the world, you ought to see the way they react. The <clears throat> our army reacted because they really weren't soldiers in the sense of rough fighting men, they were <clears throat> all more or less handicapped in one way or another. And the, <clears throat> I think they stole a couple of cows, he, he enumerated, and they got out, out of there as fast as they could with the cows and the pigs that they had confiscated. And he said it, re it really looked like a Max Brothers cartoon. Was, uh was that your most memorable experience, or what? That wasn't mine, that was his. Well, of, of, the, of the time you spent in the uh, military, what was your most memorable? God, at the time, everything was. Uh -huh. The time we were constantly, it's like li living in a sword, sword's edge, you never know what's going to happen next. <clears throat> All kinds of rumors floating around. This was going to happen. That was going to happen. <coughs> um, it reminds me of another story. We had a baker who was li living in the same place. My, my wife had joined me down there, and we'd got a very small apartment and small complex. And there was a cook signed to headquarters company in Fort Sam that was in the same complex. Mm -hmm. And his wife could not understand the army worth a damn. And every time Oscar was late or had to break something because he had duty, his wife had one cry. They can't do that to you. How little did she do? She thought this was a civilian job. Huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. They, could, they can't do that to you. You got, to, you got tomorrow off. I, I know this is uh, getting slightly off the subject of the military, but when were you and your wife married? We were married 1941. 
Okay, so just uh, just prior to the war breaking out? But yeah, prior to the war. Uh -huh. what, what month? We're married on August 17th. Uh -huh. okay. do, you, uh, do you remember what it was like when, when the war first broke? Where were you? Well, I was working in Felines. We were in Boston. Mm -hmm. And everything was was the start of rationing and things of that nature. The, everything went to the army. You got, if you had an auto, you got a sticker A, B, a C, and you could only get so much gas depending upon your sticker. And they start handing out ra rationing cards for things like butter and meat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> everything went to the military. How much gas could you get? I don't remember, but it was very, very little if you had an A sticker. You couldn't do much of anything. Is that what those little stickers were in the window? Yeah, the when you see the uh, text things going back, when you see the old film or a film of wartime, uh -huh. you see A, B, C, and it was very little gas. You couldn't do much of anything. Uh -huh. Black markets arose. <coughs> Did you ever use it? No. No. I didn't have a car. Oh, well, that would make your choice easy. Mm -hmm. the, the, those days were different than these days. Mm -hmm. Cars were, I won't say few and far between, but most people didn't own them. Mm -hmm. Was it very difficult during the war with rationing? or? Well, I, I, I wasn't directly exposed to it. Mm -hmm because we were in the uh, service, but we could, my wife could go down to the PX and things of that nature, but things were very difficult. The civil civilians did not have it easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what were you discharged? February 46. Mm -hmm. And was that at Sam, Sam Houston? I, I was sent back to Fort Devon Street in Ordinary course of events, you got discharged from the same uh, place you were inducted. So mm -hmm. I was sent back to Fort Camp Devons to be discharged. Mm -hmm. You never thought about staying in, uh, was it Texas? No, when I got out, my wife was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, I was never really a military man. Oh. Um, was it your first baby your wife was pregnant with? Yes. Okay. Um, do you remember what your feelings were coming home? Yeah, great elation. Really? You're I, I couldn't believe it until I got out, frankly. What was it like? Well, we'd been disappointed so many times in so many ways during the Army. As I said, the Army of necessity, I'm not criticizing it, of necessity, the Army goes strictly by the Army's needs, not the individual's needs. The, the Army exists for one reason only, and that's to win. So everything else became secondary. If they needed something or someone, that became top priority, and the, you had to adjust to that fact. Did you like the Army at all? I didn't hate it, but I didn't, I wasn't in love with it. Mm -hmm. What was toughest about it? The uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You never knew what or when. You'd, as we said in the, the civilian tape we made, you'd invite a couple you knew to dinner and they wouldn't show up and the next day you'd learn that his outfit had been shipped out. And as we also said, you found out, the most ways you found out was on the bus. The bus drivers knew what was going on. The civilians knew what was going on. Those uh, signs, loose lips sink ships, very true. Really? I'm sure that same is true around every army camp. The, you had lots of civilians working in them. Mm -hmm. And as for that matter, the soldiers themselves, even though you sent censored letters, <coughs> most of them had some kind of codes set up with their family, so <coughs> they knew whether they were going to Europe or to Asia, to the Pacific, 
or wherever, so civilians knew as military intelligence is really an oxymoron <laughs> of military secrecy, there is no such thing. Uh, what was, uh, what was the feelings of your family and, and the community as a whole when you came back? Oh, you're welcome back. Everybody was glad you got back. Uh, this, it, it, World War II was a, quote, popular war. Mm -hmm. Not like the wars that came later, which were very unpopular. Mm -hmm. Everybody accepted the fact that it was necessary, and we were just anxious to win because we did take a terrible beating. And, <clears throat> on the, on uh, when the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Were there any parties or parades that you remember? When we got home, there were parties. When we went in, there were parties for us. Can you remember one particular party or parade when you got home? Well, I can remember one. It's really funny. When I went in at one party, a man, my, my wife had worked for a large clothing manufacturer who became a uniform manufacturer and one of the men who worked with her and whom she was friendly with had party just before I went in said when I got out he'd see he was going into business for himself. He opened up a <coughs> men's clothing store. He said he'd he promised me my first civilian suit when I got out. Somehow when I got out, he, he seems to have forgotten the promise. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how that happens. Um, how important, when you look back, how important was it to you to have served in your military? I'm sorry, I didn't. How important was it to, to have served? Oh, to me it was very important. Mm -hmm. I was drafted, but before I was drafted, I tried to enlist in the coast, in, first in the Army, then the Navy, and then the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. And I, I weighed about 103 pounds at that time, so they turned me down in all three because the absolute minimum weight was 105, or 106 maybe. And under no circumstances were you supposed to be drafted if you weighed less. But when I was drafted, mm -hmm. they needed men. And as I said, the Army went by need. Mm -hmm. They overlooked the fact that I didn't meet the minimum weight requirement. Mm. Um, did serving have a, a great effect on your life, and what was that, if it did? Not really that much, because I hadn't been subjected to the horrors of war. Mm -hmm. So to, re I, to readjust to civilian life was not difficult to me because in many ways I'd been a civilian while I was in the service. Mm -hmm. I was just looking at this next question, which, which is fascinating, and, and you get so many different answers. Um, how do you feel about the different, difference in public opinion on the different wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam? Well, I think it's horrible. I think that it isn't up to the individual to decide which war he he thinks is good. We elect, we have elected representatives, and I think that the people should support every war effort. If you think the war is wrong, vote out the people who voted for the war and get a new government in who'll arrange for an honorable peace or to get out of the war if you're against the war, but for somebody to run up to Canada or uh, things of that nature, I think is all wrong. Do you remember the Vietnam era very sure. well? Sure. How did it make you feel when, when you saw protests? Or As I said, I thought, I thought they were all wrong. I, I think people have a right to object but there's a limit to objection. <clears throat> I'm not saying go along pl placidly with what the government says, but it is our government and what some of the people, Jane Fonda, for example, uh, 
That's 200% wrong. Uh, uh, to me, that was practic that w not practically, that was treason, period. Mm -hmm. You're talking about our trip to Hanoi? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, well, onto a, onto a somewhat happier thought. Um, what, was there like one memory or thought you'd like to share with your family, uh, the community, or, or future generations, your experience? Not really. I think it's something that everybody got to adjust to, and I think that war, horrible as it is, and I sincerely pray that our government, or for that matter, no other, any government doesn't have to go through it again, but when I see the massacres that are taking place all over the world, I don't know what... I, I guess I go along with Teddy Roosevelt, walk soft, speak softly and carry a big stick. Mm -hmm. And with that, I guess we'll end the interview. And I want to thank you very much, Nate, for, You're welcome. for doing this. Thank you. You take care. Thank you, too.